um, welcome to my fellow Makati West, uh, Makati Rotarians, and welcome to my treasure of friends from Makati West. This is a hybrid meeting with a face-to-face -face, uh, physical meeting combined with a virtual meeting on Zoom, which is ongoing. Um, this is our second joint meeting this Rotary year. And I think we have to thank President Louis and President Franco from work, for working well together to bring the best two clubs in this district together. Um, I, I just want to recognize a member that we haven't seen for almost three years. May I ask him to rise? Conrad Marty. Welcome back. Welcome. I see a lot of um, uh, second generation. We have past president Charlie Rufino here and his son, his son uh, past president Carlo Rufino also. Then we have our director Chito Cantada and his son, Luis. Maybe, can I ask Luis to rise so the Makati Rotarians can recognize how much handsomer he is? I saw, I saw Luis. There he is, waving. That's the son of Chito Cantada. He has hair. Okay, some admin matters. For those who are joining via Zoom, um, here are some house rules. Please be advised that your microphones, the microphones of non-program participants will be muted, muted to help to help keep the background noise to a minimum, may request the guests or non-Rotarians to please type in the comment box your club affiliation or the Rotarian who invited you so that you can be properly acknowledged. For the open forum, we will have a Q&A uh, here at the venue while those who are joining us virtually can type in there at the comment box of Zoom and the secretariat will pass it on to me so that your questions can be entertained. Um, uh, some more house rules. Uh, clapping after the speaker, after the guest speaker's uh, presentation is encouraged. Laughing after the moderator makes a, joy, a joke is also encouraged. Okay. <laughs> and um, let's get uh, started. They may ask life-changing president Louis Asioche of Rotary Club of Makati to call this meeting to order. In behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, I call this joint meeting to order. May I ask life-changing President Franco del Rosario of the Rotary Club of Mac Makati West to call this meeting to order. Yes, um, President Louis is the star of this uh, meeting, so I'll just uh, open the meeting from here. Hello, hello, hello. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati West, I call this 2,352nd meeting to order. I, I, I miss that energy. <laughs> Attorney Louis, um, uh, we should give you a shot of uh, some uh, yeah. adrenaline to get you started in that same manner. May I ask you all please to rise for our inv invocation by Rotarian Jimmy Flor Cruz of Makati West. Fellow Rotarians, let's put ourselves in the presence of God. Loving Lord, today we gladly welcome you into our midst 
as we hold this joint meeting in your holy name. We thank you for the opportunity to break bread with our fellow Rotarians from the other clubs to renew old acquaintances and to gain new ones. Today, however, Lord, we are at a highly self-conscious moment of our history. We are a people buffeted and blown about by crises and change, torn by conflict and disunity, and seared by pain and frustration. We ask you, Lord, therefore, through our fellow Rotarians and the prepared ideas of our honored guest, that you bestow, bestow upon us all during this joint meeting, the guiding light that will show us the, light, the right path in our search for identity and meaning in life, the indomitable human spirit in our search for truth, the emotional high in our pursuit for beauty and love in fellowship, and the strong will in our search for what is good. May warm friendships, the sharing of the speaker, the lively exchange of human feelings, thoughts, and hopes, and your divine presence during the joint meeting lead us to the positive conclusion that is good to be here. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. That was nice. Uh, before we go to the anthem, um, um, we had Jimmy Flor Cruz uh, as our guest speaker six months ago. We should have tied in on to an application to club membership then. <laughs> President Louis, uh, please make sure that Manolo doesn't uh, leave uh, this afternoon <laughs> without signing the application. <laughs> okay. No poaching. Okay. All right. So, um, Secretariat, can we now have the uh, Rotary Club of Makati West hymn? A national anthem. Sorry. <laughs> Makati West. Hi. Sorry, Makati. Yeah. Along the way, giving hope to the world. 
now let us hear from the club with the younger age profile and see if they have more gusto in their in the singing of their hymn. Okay. was nice. Okay, before we proceed, I think it's but fitting, besides knowing and introducing each other, uh, I'd like to start by asking President-elect Michael Escaler to rise so you could be recognized, our incoming president. Thank you, Michael. And I'd like to ask President-elect uh, Hil Chua at the back to please rise so you can be recognized as well. Oh, by the way, R.C. Makati has presidents for the next five years. Is, is it the same in Makati West? No. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just go through this, the four-way test. The four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Can you please repeat after me? First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, yes, please. Um, I think um, Makati West has a supplemental four-way test. Could that be played, please, on, on screen? Um, here, would you like? Yes, please. Please join me. So, good afternoon. I'm Lamarck. So for the Rotary uh, Club of Makati West, we have our own supplemental four-way test, starting with, is it recognition? So we make it a point to recognize our members, small or big achievements, accomplishments by individual members or families. And then second, is it retention? So we re regularly ask our members to share their feedback because that's the way also that um, we know and we can serve and help better. Then um, number three, is it recruitment? So it is the desire of um, each member that um, we grow as a club as we also, of course, uh, keep on saying that we increase our capacity to serve. And so recommending the club to friends, peers, and acquaintances. And lastly, is it fun? As um, you've all uh, heard as we were singing. So that's the Rotary Club of Makati Westway to always have fun. So thank you. That was very nice. Uh, President Carlo, well done. Okay. 
Uh, President Louis, I like the fun part. Maybe we should have one just on the fun part. And uh, <laughs> thank you anyway, by the way. <laughs> okay, I'll be doing the birthday and anniversary greetings. Uh, Lemark Limosnero, May 26, that passed. Uh, the son of Director Chito Cantada, Luis Cantada, uh, two days ago. Happy birthday. Oh, good friends. Christophe Lejeune, uh, spouse Paula Cristobal on the 30th today. Uh, Tony Del Rosario, also today from Makati West. Uh, Scott Moore, as well today. And uh, an, uh, spouse Angie ha uh, Hager. Okay, and for, uh, for R.C. Makati, it's Wash Lu. He said he will come, but I don't see him around. That's his birthday also today. And he is here. Past President Jun Jun Dairit. Happy birthday tomorrow. Please rise. Where's Jun Jun? Happy birthday. And James Buskowicz on uh, June 6th. Uh, there's only one wedding anniversary, Johnny and Nancy C. on June 4. Um, Secretariat, is there anyone to acknowledge? Uh, who? Scott Moore. Uh, Scott, are you here? Can you? Can you rise for your, you may be a, Everyone from uh, the Rotary Club of Makati and the Rotary Club of Makati West, may I ask? Yes, I will. Yes, yes. I will uh, may I ask you please to give a very warm round of applause for the incoming Secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry. Bravo, Fred. Past President Fred Pasquale. By the way, it is also the birthday of our guest speaker, Manolo Quezon. Did, do we have a bigger, bigger cake for him to blow? I think it's there at the back. It's there at the back. Okay. Okay. So now we proceed with our uh, president's time. Mr. President, which of you would like to... Uh, who will do the honors? Ladies first or... Um, how do we do this? A toss coin? Uh, 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 he's the star first. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Press. I have to, forgot to acknowledge, acknowledge the, um, those who have joined us uh, virtually. I'm sorry, Mr. Press. Uh, Rotary Ants, we have Nelly Bengson and Lady Yvonne Kwan, uh, life-changing presidents. We have your classmate, Rina Lopez from RC Makati Premier Yay! District. Okay. Other guests, uh, Jude Balayan, a guest of PE Hilchua. Amel Moti, guest also of PE Hilchua. President Louis, they're going to beat us with new members uh, pretty soon with, the, with all the guests that's showing up. Monsur Del Rosario. Yeah. Makati West is getting handsomer, you know. It's, uh, 
this is uh, rubbing it in, you know. Um, past President Margie Lambrete of the Rotary Club of Paranaque Metro, Rotarian Tai Zun. He's a visiting Rotarian. Is he here? There you are. Welcome. He's the guest of uh, Robert Yupanko. Uh, there's Louis, Lu Lourdes Gordolan, Maria Olive Arellano, Corina Kalau, and past president, Rhea Recomite. Mr. Prez, it's your time. Uh, more? Is there more? Okay, so thank you, Vice President Tony. You seem to be at home with these two clubs. Although at times I, I, I see, I could sense a bit of anxiety. Huh? <laughs> so good afternoon. Uh, today marks the last joint meeting that the Rotary Club of Makati will be having this Rotary year. And what better way to culminate it than a joint meeting with our firstborn daughter club, RC Makati West. As I said during the previous meeting, the penultimate month of Rotary year 2021 to 2022, which is May, was devoted to joint meetings with three daughter clubs. Makati Premier District, and I see classmate Rina Lopez over there, last May 17, Makati Business District last week, and today Makati West. As LCP Franco is wont to say, we reserve the best for last. There is actually a history of this joint meeting with Makati West. My classmate, LCP Franco, was actually thinking of asking me, asking me to be one of the speakers in a fireside chat type of, of meeting. Uh, but I told classmate Franco that I have a way better speaker to offer, but that he has committed to be the guest speaker in our club. And Franco agreed, and that is why we're having this joint meeting between our two great clubs with no less than Mr. Manolo Quezon, noted columnist and historian and editorial writer as our guest speaker. Thank you, Manolo, for giving us your time. This is actually the second time that Mr. Quezon will be addressing the Rotary Club of Makati, but now jointly with Makati West. And this, is, this was made possible by past president, Carlo Rufino. Thank you, Carlo. Today, we meet for the first time outside our two customary venues, our quote-unquote homes, so to speak, the Peninsula Manila, where we used to hold our regular weekly meetings before the pandemic, and our own clubhouse in Guadalupe Viejo during the pandemic. We are now scouting for a possible new venue for our regular meetings under the term of President-elect Mike Escaler. To our members in the Rotary Club of Makati, your suggestions for an alternative meeting venues would be most welcome as our clubhouse will be undergoing major repairs and renovation this coming Rotary year. Please help us also, PP Charlie. <laughs> we shall be trying out different venues, actually, PP Charlie, before we settle on to a regular venue for our weekly meetings. Now, last weekend, the incoming board of PE Mike Escaler assembled at the Club Punta Fuego in Nasugbu, Batangas for a two day planning session to discuss the plans, objectives, and budgets for the upcoming Rotary year. We look forward to another successful and fun year under PE Michael Escaler. Allow me again to thank the following hosts for opening their doors during our two-day planning session at Punta Fuego. Of course, President-elect Michael and Papat Escaler, past District Governor Sid and Tesha Garcia, and past President Tito and Bryn Panlilio. They made sure that our stay will not only be productive, but enjoyable and comfortable from, not only from accommodations, breakfast, but also for transportation. The welcome lunch was hosted by past District Governor Sid and Tesha. Day one dinner was hosted by President-elect Michael and Papat at their home, and, their, and the farewell dinner was hosted by past President Tito and Bryn. Thanks also to past district governor, Tony Kila for offering his rest house and Rotarian I.I. Galvez for the room vouchers that were used by some members. Also on behalf of the Makati Rotary 
Club Foundation, Chair Peter Manzano, and the rest of the board, I am requesting that all our members at the Rotary Club of Makati to attend our very important meeting next Tuesday, the 7th day of June at 12 noon at the Makati Clubhouse for the foundation's annual members meeting. I must reiterate that this is one meeting where we need the presence either in person or by proxy of a majority of our members. I cannot emphasize it well enough. We need to attain a quorum for the June 7 annual members meeting. If for some reason you will be unable to attend in person, kindly accomplish the proxy forms that have been sent to you and send them back to the secretariat on or before the sixth day of June. Prior to the meeting at 12 noon, a groundbreaking of the Prid Paing Hechanova Creativity Center will take place at 11 a.m. Please join IPP Peter and me for that momentous event on June 7 to institutionalize the memory of our beloved Paing Hechanova. And lastly, allow me to congratulate our past president, Alfredo Fred Pascual, for being named as incoming secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry. Congrats, PP Fred. We have, we in RC Makati will have a club hosted cocktails to celebrate and honor our new DTI secretary tomorrow, June 1, 5 to 7.30 p.m. at the upper lobby of the Manila Peninsula. Heavy cocktail fair will be served. Please come in business attire. That's it, we Tony. Okay. Um, before I call on President uh, Franco, you know, for the 23 years I was with Makati West, there's one thing I realized. When anyone is speaking in the podium, your members continue to talk. <laughs> it hasn't changed. So, <laughs> so I'm just warning Manolo, when you speak later, that's common, but they're listening. But they're multitasking. Okay. President Franco, please, for your kind words. So, um, LCP Louis is the main star of this uh, meeting. So, um, I don't want to take any thunder from him. So, I'll just speak from here, if you don't mind. That's reserved for main star. So, would any Makati West members like to give my standard starting three words? of the president's time? <laughs> no, that's when I opened the meeting. It is welcome, welcome, welcome <laughs> to our seventh in-person meeting here uh, for this Rotary year. So I'm very happy, fortunate that um, I, I thought that we would never be able to do in-person meeting during my term, but here we are. And uh, let's hope that this continues so that PE Hill, you will have 40 in-person meetings during your term. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy uh, to see um, so many of you. Um, we have a great turnout. Um, so many of you who don't have a fear of normal. We still have a fear of normal among some of our members who haven't had a uh, chance to attend any of our in-person meetings. So um, I guess it's fear of normal also in two senses, right? Because of uh, still COVID is out there and also because um, they'd rather stay home and be relaxed in their pajamas the whole day. <laughs> so um, first, I, I want, I wish to thank the following. First and foremost, LCP Louis for inviting the Rotary Club of Makati West to this um, lunch meeting. And, um, you know, we have a LCP Viber group in the district. And there's not a week that passes by that I don't see President Louis doing something. I mean, this guy is all over the country. As you can see in your 
Makatiwas people, if you, if you notice in their hymn, it's all about President Louis all over the, he is tireless, he is, um, you know, overachiever, he is a one of a kind. So let's give a big hand to President Louis, please. So uh, also, I want to thank um, uh, Makati um, members for coming here today. And of course, to our guest speaker, uh, happy birthday, sir. And my fellow men of Zes, um, as uh, mentioned by um, President Louis, this is our third joint meeting with R.C. Makati this Rotary year. We had him, uh, we had Rotary Makati be a joint meeting when we had architect Jojo Tolentino as the three of us sat in the same board uh, in a uh, private company. And we had him also, had this club also as our joint meeting club during um, June Neri, uh, the PBI economist, and now for here for the third time. So actually, we'll let you on something. Before our term started, um, LCP, Louis, and I agreed that we will really make an effort to bring our clubs together, closer together. So, um, so to give us much time to our guest speaker, I will only mention just a few spectacular things about Rotary Club of Makati. One, RCM is a six-time recipient of the district's most prized twin awards, the overall most outstanding club and overall most outstanding club president award. Rotary Club Makati has an aggregate contribution to the Rotary Foundation of almost two and a half million dollars. Last but not least, for the last 25 years, Rotary Club Makati has received about a million and a half dollars in grants. So our club also wishes much success to DTI secretary nominee and RCM past president, Fred Pasqual. And of course, I have to mention who I'm very proud of, past president Carlos Del Rosario, a past president of Rotary Club Makati. So um, I, I'll make, you know, initially uh, our guest speaker had to leave early, but now he's no longer uh, has to leave early, correct? So now I'll revert to my usual 20 minute uh, president's time. <laughs> And um, Vice President Tony, look, they're listening to me, <laughs> see? I would like to invite everyone and especially our good friends at Rotary Club Makati to join us in the Martin Nevera Benefit Concert to benefit our gift of life. Uh, we aim to raise enough funds from this concert uh, to... Um, to raise enough 100 life saving surgeries. This is uh, on Saturday, June 25th at the Soler Theater. Okay, so um, please help us uh, by buying some tickets. Um, on your way out, there's a seating chart of Soler, so you can see where uh, the, your desired tickets are located. So we will do our best to get you your preferred seats, but um, Ticket World has been selling uh, tickets uh, online uh, now for about a month. So um, many tickets are already sold. So please hurry. Either give your order to your secretary as you, give, as you leave or immediately go online on the Ticket World platform. Okay. So um, I wish to thank our members who already have purchased. Please consider purchasing more. And I have an assignment for all our members uh, outside, and it will also be um, sent to you by message, the list of our members who have not yet bought. So I would like to ask the members here who have bought to please take a look at and pick select three names of our members who haven't bought, and please invite them to a pre-concert dinner with you at Soler on that evening. Um, 
So if anyone here wants to um, help organize a small group pre-concert dinner, I will do. I will happily do that for you. Uh, you contact me or any of our hardworking concert committee meeting. Uh, please come early to the concert so that we can have time to fellowship it, with it one another. Um, please do take the time to read uh, our West Side Story. So it's been sent to you also uh, online. And instead of our happy, uh, usual weekly happy hour Thursday at the Pantry uh, Garden here in the Ducey to tell, uh, please attend um, in Patrick Dionisio's house. Let's give him a big hand. Pat on Thursday for our Mongolian barbecue night. If you were in the last fellowship dinner with at Patrick's house, it was a blast. So please don't do don't miss this one. And um, for those of you who are board of directors and club advisors this year and next Rotary year, we have a joint, uh, joint board meeting following our usual Thursday club meeting a week from Thursday, where we have our guest speaker, Ciel Habito, uh, as our sp speaker. So uh, I'll give an another opportunity to um, any Makati West who wants to close my uh, President's time, anybody? You rock, you rock! <laughs> so everybody, have a good afternoon. And Menoses, she will be called later to make a committee announcement. I will, after, the, after you. After, after me. So Menoses, you rock! President Louis, with all those accolades, I presume you should be buying a few tickets for the concert. You did them. Okay. By the way, by the way, Mr. Mr. Press, I, I wish to let you know that you only have a few more weeks of your term left. Makati West has a very good project, showcase project called the Gift of Life. Uh, maybe you may want to consider something to that effect uh, that could also get us to jumpstart our own uh, that we discussed during the planning session. Okay, unless you want more accolades. Uh, he wants a few more to, to get him. <laughs> huh? uh, PE Mike is, uh, Michael Escalera is there. Yes, so may I, may I call uh, to come on stage, please? A person with the perfect DNA, uh, LCP, LCP, uh, LC, life-changing President Rina Lopez, please, you have an announcement to make. You didn't get it, uh, the perfect DNA. Uh, I was wondering what you meant by a perfect DNA. <laughs> yeah, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, LCP Franco and LCP Louis, for inviting uh, me to be here with all the men. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I I came in and I said, oh my God, I, I feel like an intruder, but um, I'm here for a good cause. I'm the life-changing president of the Rotary Club of Makati Premier District. Um, and we've had joint meetings with uh, both your clubs. And um, we'd like to invite you to our golf tournament on June 24. It's a Friday, the day before um, Martin Live. And um, yeah, uh, for you to be sponsors and or players. I hear there are a lot of players here in your club and also a lot of sponsors. So <laughs> we'd like to invite you to be both. No? Um, it's uh, in Kandubang Golf Club um, on uh, June 24. Um, hi, Manolo. Um, anything else? So thank you so much. Um, we'll just give Franco and Louis the details. And uh, yeah, I hope you can sign up. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Louis, if you were to challenge President Franco on a golf, golf competition, I, I tell you, Makati West has pretty good golfers. Yeah? But 
you know, if, but if you get PE Michael Escalier in our team as captain, uh, we'll be all right. Okay, um, Carlo, may I ask you please to take over? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, my fellow Rotarians. Um, before I start my uh, introduction, uh, can we please greet our guest speaker? Manola's birthday was actually yesterday. So thank you for attending. So I won't go too long in his um, introduction. I think it, it speak, he, everyone knows him. But um, one little known fact is he's a very good friend of my eldest brother, JV. Um, you used to go up to Baguio and, and they would have discussions late into the night by the fireplace talking about history and politics. And of all of us, except for my dad probably, all of us were glassy-eyed, couldn't under keep up with, their, um, with what they're talking about. But what we do learn or what we do find out is history um, repeats itself, right? As, as George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think it's all the more uh, important in this time of uh, the world we're going through to re revisit what's happened before and learn from our mistakes or learn also the good things as well. Um, and that's why all the more important that historians like Manolo are listened to and heard from. Um, and he has a very good show, The Explainer, where he was showing or uh, explaining the history to us. Because it's one thing to read it in the textbooks and another to understand it, um, especially for the masses. Um, for those of us who are educated, I think we're fortunate to understand it and remember. But uh, unfortunately, the mass um, population of our country are um, sometimes forgetful. So I think it's key to remember it. Um, then um, before I end, um, of course, you have his CV. He's a columnist, of, of course, of our, our paper, P PDI. Um, he's had an explainer on the ABS-CBN News Channel. And he has a Proyecto Filipino with um, GMA's term. So, and an Ayala Museum stint as well. So it's all in his CV. Um, now to end, um, one thing I do like about Manola is i uh, been trying out our vegan restaurant over in Makati Square called The Sexy Kitchen uh, with his family. And they've been really uh, very advocates of our of clean, healthy eating. <laughs> Manola loves food as well. So if you ever need um, or you want, it, you want him to talk to, to you, invite him for dinner. So without further ado, Manola, please take it away. Thanks for having me, um, especially I understand that this is quite a unique situation to have two distinguished clubs um, slumming it together. So I'm glad to be here. Um, it's an interesting group I, I realized because the last time I saw, uh, I talked to Jaime Flor Cruz was right before a state visit to Beijing. And this was when I was still in government. And some of uh, us here in the audience today are fresh from the trenches, Monsoor. So um, this is going to be an interesting experience to try to tell you about things that perhaps you might know a little better than me, but I'm going to start. So um, first of all, we have to see if the PowerPoint will work. And here we go, okay. I was told I have 20 minutes. So of course, this is going to take 40 to 60 minutes. I was going to start with 150 slides, but the good news is I trimmed it down to 75 slides and that's about two slides a second. So let's see where we get. But my topic for today is I believe that we are in the period of our growth as a nation where we are going from our current fifth republic to a sixth republic. What that republic will look like, none of us, I think, can be sure. But why we are where I think we are is part of my topic for today. If just so if we all remember, our current fifth republic was established in 1987 with the approval of the constitution in that same year. And so, um, what we have recently elected would be the seventh president of our fifth republic. So let me move forward. Um, if the guy can see me, that's supposed to be the gesture. I'm going to ask you to. I'm going to ask you to go with me on a journey. We're going to look, and we're going to go backwards and forwards 
quite a little bit. I'm going to hopefully try not to make it so confusing, but I do believe that um, there is this phrase that I borrowed from uh, Leon Maria Guerrero that um, today began yesterday. And in our discussion this afternoon, I'm going to walk you through four parts uh, to tell this story of how what we are going through today began yesterday. The first would be to actually compress two separate presentations that I've given, but because for time, um, I will conflate them into one. And it is the story of the rise and fall of our present republic. The second is to discuss the victory that took place earlier this month. What happened to make it possible and what it represents. The third part is that for every winner, there is a loser in terms of a contest, in terms of the future direction. And finally, we are living in a period of restoration. And that in itself has its own dynamics. Um, there is a famous saying from the court of uh, Louis XIV, where one of the courtesans famously said, after us comes the deluge. And so that is what I will be closing on. So let's, uh, let's start. Here I'm going to talk to you about the rise and fall of our fifth republic. It is a rise and fall that carries with it our previous republics, even the Commonwealth and other eras moving forward. Let's see, okay. All of you here are old enough to know that the history or our experience as a newly re restored democracy since 1987 has been like this visual. We have gone from one extreme to another, almost like clockwork with every election. We have gone from reform to populism, back to reform, back to populism. It seemed a kind of pattern that would be fixed until something happened. But first, let me look at, let me re, let's just review what these two sides were. Reform is a state of mind. It is an approach. It is one probably very close to your heart compared to the other one I will discuss. It's one that says that when we are in government, those who are doing the government, the governing, should be doing it not for themselves, but for all of us. And for that reason, it appeals to people who are systems oriented, modern looking, um, institutional in their approach. That includes many Rotarians, that includes the clergy, that includes members of academe, what we call civil society, the middle class, and of course, our partners in business abroad. But there is another side, and that would be those who act and live out the behavior of populism, appealing to the public. It's one that does not try to bring everyone together to try to work things out as a group and a team. It is one that very clearly says, we are in it for ourselves. We are in it for ourselves against others. It is for that reason, very proud and very insistent on being anti-elitist, even though many of its leaders and many of its movers and shakers are from the elite, but they identify as being outsiders, as being rebels, as being iconoclasts. Their message to the many out there is, I am like you and I will help you. It's a very direct and very patronage oriented point of view. Now, if this was what we were going through back and forth, 
Is there a reason why this was so? Randy David, who many of you know and, and who is our, one of our leading sociologists, says there's actually a kind of problem at the heart of this. Why we swing from one to the other. He has defined it as something that he calls the crisis of modernity. I once was on a plane and there was, of course, a distinguished person beside me. He had lived abroad for a long time, coming home, and was telling me so many in interesting things about how, I think he was from Chicago, so about how they were doing things to improve the politics there, how, how he had a sister in London and how she was describing to him how things were done there and a nephew in Saudi who was doing incredibly interesting things there as well. And how in all of these places, they saw something that Filipinos always miss, which is things that work and things that function and things that are the way they are supposed to be. And he was saying, you know, that there are all these solutions to all the problems. But as the plane was landing, all of a sudden he started taking out a big wad of bills and then he was counting them out. So at first I thought he was just bragging about his money. So I was just watching him politely. And then finally I couldn't resist it. And I said, sir, what, um, what's this for? And he goes, ah, well, you know, we're going home. So this is for customs. This is for the... This is for the police in case, you know, they stop my car. This is for the barangay tanod and so on and so forth. And it made me realize when I read what Randy David had to say, that there really is a crisis that occurs in each of us and in all of us as a society. We want to be modern. We want to do things the way it's done in places that we think do it well. But there's a part of us that doesn't want to give up the perks, the palakasan, the pabulong, the padulas. There is this crisis of modernity. And, and as Randy David puts it eloquently, he says, this is what happens in societies where an old way is dying, but a new way is still waiting to be born. And again, I would ask you as we go through this presentation to see how this happens in business, in our families, in our schools, and what more in our politics. So in this crisis of modernity, what can we see? I think that there will come moments when a push becomes a shove when the direction finally tips in one way or another. There's this marvelous quote very recently by Martin Kettle in The Guardian. And he was describing a British Prime Minister, James Callaghan, talking about the Maggie Thatcher phenomenon. And he was saying, there comes a period, maybe every 30 years, when something just happens and all of a sudden you know things have changed forever. Academics will try to identify it, but all of you, whether you study it or just live through it, will sort of feel it in your bones. Something will be electric in the air, someone new will come along, and all the old givens will no longer apply. I believe in our lifetimes, we have lived through at least two of those moments. And I will get to that um, story as we proceed. The first of these moments was the assassination of Nino Aquino at a time we forget that was only uh, two years after the inaugural for the third time of President Marcos, in which he claimed the highest percentage of votes ever achieved by any leader in our history. This was the shock that would lead to the birth of our present Republic. This was the founding crisis when all of a sudden everything that had seemed so sure that President Marcos was completely unassailable in power, 
that the system that had been put in place was completely unchangeable. All of a sudden, everything was up in the air. The next would come in 2015 when the son of Nino Aquino did one thing. And I know personally because I was there when he decided out of a genuine feeling of wanting to do something for the families of the 40 who were killed at Mama Sapono. What happened was the president did not show up at Villamor Air Base when the coffins of the 40 staff arrived. To my mind, and in what I have written since then upon reflection, I believe that that was the moment that the Fifth Republic came to an end. What do I mean? Remember that I had told you that there had been this pendulum swinging back and forth from reform to populism. In that period, from 1987 to 2016, the pendulum shifted because we would try reform and then we, we, would, we would find that it was leaving too many of us out and we would swing the other way to someone who said they cared more. And then we would see the limitations of that because if they cared more, they also could steal more. And then it would swing back. The dividing line, the sort of hinge that made that pendulum swing was not just one family, the Aquinos, although they had the prestige when they wanted to come out and actually call sitting presidents to task, but everything else that was born of that 1983 experience. A church that could withdraw the mandate of heaven from administrations and a civil society that knew how to organize protests and sit-ins and statements and symposiums. But when Mama Sapono happened and this trauma happened, an entire people that had accompanied one family through the wake of Ninoy, when some of you will remember, it took an act of courage just to go to Santo Domingo Church or to the funeral of Cori Aquino, which was as much an expression of guilt because at one point people had started not to take her seriously anymore. All of a sudden, that shared experience was cut. And the heir and the exemplar of that shared experience, who happened to be president at the time, suddenly found himself not only disappointing, but being hated by many people who had supported them through thick and thin for a generation. When that happened, it's like that Maggie Thatcher moment the balance of power was lost. And the depth of emotion uh, that I believe many people experienced meant that everything was up in the air again. So that sets the stage, I believe, for what we're going to look at um, to a deeper level. I call this period that happened in 2015, the great divorce. It was one where you can pinpoint its beginning and really pinpoint its end, which is a rare thing to do in the life of any country or society. It takes us then to what happened after that. That was in 2015. By 2016, what had begun as a transfer of power became another transfer of power to take it away. Because this time, the representative of empathy, the representative of caring, a very basic word, was no longer the sitting president who was about to leave office or his family. It was now an outsider from Davao. We, we tend to think, of President Duterte as a tough person, a person who um, could be 
violent and could put the fear of, if not God, then himself in all our institutions. But we forget the secret of this man has been that he incarnates for so many Filipinos the word empathy. And he was able to seize this because of the fundamental disappointment that had happened the year before. This is what made it so powerful and has made it unshakable for six years. And th this is what we're looking at. So that sets the stage. Now I want you to step back a little further, a little earlier in time. All of this is taking place among us, we the Filipinos, and we the Filipinos, whether we know it or not, have certain ingrained attitudes and perspectives, a product of our history, a product of our culture, whatever it is, it is there and I think we have to acknowledge them. The first of these involves um, something that Carlos P. Romulo once said, and I believe the longer I live, the more I realize it's true. He said, what Filipinos seek in a president is someone who will make decisions for them. This is the characteristic of we, the Filipinos, that provides both reform and populism its mandates. The idea that we will deliver it lock, stock, and barrel to the person we pick. But there is, uh, for those who are lawyers here, the, there's a colatilia to this. And this is something my grandfather said. And again, the longer I live, the more I realize that he was correct. He has three observations about power. And this was something he was talking to an American friend. He says, we Filipinos care more for good government than self-government. There's a very big difference. The second is, while we may hand power to someone, there are limits. What are these limits? He said, one is that either you will exceed your powers, in other words, you will become abusive, or you will engage in improprieties and use that power for yourself. These are the very broad but very clear limits within our society of what our leaders can do and get away with. And if you reflect on the history of our administrations, it is an excess of one or the other that will get presidents and their administrations in trouble. So long as they do not cross these lines, they can do practically anything. And finally, the bedrock condition for leadership in the Philippines is the president must maintain order. Order is defined in many ways for different people. For property owners, it is the sanctity of, of, the, of your home and its territory. Contracts, security, but maintenance of order. And the president who loses control or is perceived to be unable to control matters is one who loses their mandate. So this is the expectation we have for the person who is the fulcrum of our government and in many ways our society. Now here are the things um, that would get in the way with it. If, and this was the moment that Rodrigo Duterte won, to my mind, the presidential debates in 2016 with one sentence, when he said, the problem of this country is leadership. And it is very true. What then are the things that get in the way of exercising leadership? Um, to my mind, that is best uh, addressed by our recognizing that the rules that we have come up with affect the behavior we undertake. I will show you two contrasting sets of rules. Some of you are maybe old enough to remember 
both of what I'll be talking about. The rules before martial law and the rules after EDSA. And how, in many ways, despite the best efforts of our best and brightest, in either case, you could say we have designed things to fail. So let me show you some, just a few examples. Before martial law, majorities elected our presidents. And of the last three presidents of the Third Republic, Diosdado Macapagal, Carlos B. Garcia, and Ferdinand Marcos, two out of three got those majorities. But Garcia already showed that the system was beginning to fail and he himself was not able to get a majority. And yet, he was the only president before martial law who didn't get a majority. In the system we have today, the opposite is the case. The presidents are elected by minorities. Until 2022, we did not have a single president who ever obtained a majority. It could be as low in 1992 as President Ramos or as high in 2010 as President Aquino, but three out of five all achieved the magic number of 39%. This tells you, first of all, that winning the presidency is an entirely different calculation from winning the presidency before martial law. Winning by convincing everyone is different from winning by convincing just a little more than the next guy. It's a very different uh, attitude in terms of who you approach, the deals you make, and the messages you send. Under the 1935 Constitution, which was the Constitution uh, under the Third Republic, the Constitution was amended five times. Um, some of it as early as within five years of the, of the approval of the 1935 Constitution. Every operating system by its nature needs improvement. A vigorous and flourishing system needs a timely manner to update it. Under our present republic, which has almost been in power and has been in power uh, as long, we have been unable to change our constitution even once. And in fact, the story of the past 30 years has been as much the constant efforts to try to do this by hook or crook, which is part of the problem, um, and being unable to do it. I, I am very hard pressed, except for maybe some monarchies or communist dictatorships to see any society where the rules of the game have remained frozen in time for so long. Because this is unhealthy and leads to an inability for the body politic to repair itself or improve itself or find a, di a direction outside of increasing and escalating radicalization. So, if these are the things that are happening, what else? Before martial law, even though we have always had powerful families, it was the families that belonged to parties. And therefore, from the selection of leaders to the competition within the parties to the competition among the parties, there was a certain um, ability to rise from the ranks on all levels. Under our present system, under the past 30 years, it has been a devolution where families have replaced the parties. This picture is very instructive because it puts in one photograph the four most powerful blocks in Philippine politics from top to bottom, all the way to barangay captains, organized 
not so much by party because the chaleco can change, but by family and family interests. This is what sets us apart even from before martial law, although you, you could see parts of it emerging. So if these are the things that are um, happening, let me bring you then a little closer to where we are today. I like to call it, just so we can remember it better, the three olds and the three news. The Chinese like doing this. You have to boil it down into things you can count. So let us look at the three olds. There are three things that over time, regardless of our constitutions, regardless of who sits in power, have remained enduring since we started having national elections in 1935. The first of these would be the fact that we have what I believe is a bandwagon democracy. That we are looking for the next big thing and everyone will then jump on a stampede to try to get in on the bandwagon before it leaves the station. The next thing is what is we have what, what um, is called a plebiscitory democracy. We believe that elections solve questions or determine questions. Our leaders like to throw issues to the people and to claim that the result of the election provides a definitive answer to that question, whether it is the person's personal leadership or the direction the country will take. And the third is we are a, let's see if it moves, Partyless democracy. No administration in the history of the Philippines since 1935 has ever lost the House of Representatives, even if the presidents themselves lose their bid for Malacanang. No incoming president, even if the previous administration won the House of Representatives, ever starts their term without a majority in the House. There is one party in the Philippines. It is the administration party, and it will form and reassemble instantly regard the moment a new president is picked. Um, that's the deal. It is understood not just by the congressman or the president, but the ordinary voter who precisely votes for their congressman to be inside the Colombo and not outside the Colombo, except for very rare instances. This has never changed. What are the three news? So let us look at the three things that have changed since 1987, since some of you your hair turned white and some of us, our middles expanded. The three news, the first of these would be, I'm willing to bet a lot in this room, uh, God bless you, by the way, still read the newspaper every day. And if you don't, shame on you. But, um, but the truth is, the old mass media has died. Social media is now the media. What happens on social media is where people get their news, even if it's manufactured. Um, about 10 years ago, I was talking to someone from a leading TV station and they were saying, the moment the Philippines reached a certain level of connectivity, the free broadcasting networks would start to die because everyone would have Netflix and have almost infinite choice. Um, the newspapers started to die the moment the internet came along and all of a sudden you could read the best of what the inquirer had to say without paying a single peso to the inquirer and more importantly, without the inquirer figuring out as lucrative a way to have their advertising online as they did on the pages. 
that is what has changed. Social is the media. And the next thing that has changed is what one American uh, science commentator, Jared Lanier, calls digital Maoism. Some of you will remember or have heard of the cultural revolution in China where everything old was attacked and all uh, examples of power were condemned. This is what we experience on a day-to-day, second-to-second basis as we live our lives increasingly through social media. It is hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people who might have been little extreme eccentrics on their own, but now discovering they have the power of numbers and that no one can resist their power and no one is owed any courtesy or even dialogue. This is a new scorched earth approach to dealing among individuals and even nations that did not exist before. And the third would be something that really occurred to me when I saw this beautiful view uh, last year in Cebu. This sailing ship comes from Spain on the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Magellan, and the Filipinos don't care. Of course, there's a pandemic, but we could have all watched it. But it really told me that the era where the West and its values, many of the things that you as Rotarians take for granted simply by belonging to Rotary, a Western institution, simply by going to schools, that followed the Western model by being part of a civil society that is a legacy of the Enlightenment, many of these things no longer matter and have completely receded out of the mental framework of the majority of our people. And therefore, this has very profound effects for the expectations and even the behaviors we bring to our government and to our dealing with each other. So if we have looked at the three olds and the three news, let me bring you to the next part. What happened on May 9, 2022? What was the victory that was achieved? What does it represent? How did it happen? Look at this um, animation. These, this is um, Pulse Asia's polling uh, leading up to and then during the presidential campaign. Up to about October or November of last year, it was promising to be an election like any other, where you would have had two or three strong candidates fighting it out, and whoever would win would eke their way to victory by a small margin compared to the rest. Then something happened by around November, which then turned the 2022 campaign, objectively speaking, into the most boring campaign in Philippine history. Because by November, we knew what the results would be, and there would be nothing anyone could do about it. Many had hoped that somehow this may not be true, that things could be changed. But now that we have the benefit of hindsight and that the numbers have validated themselves, what was this dividing line? that changed what would have been yet another election, predictable and ordinary under the Fifth Republic into perhaps the first election of the coming Sixth Republic. Well, it comes from our looking at simple math. You had seen earlier in the slides I'd shown you that no president under our current republic had ever achieved the majority. And that is as much a function of the rules because unlike 
the old days, we have a multi-party system. So it's really much harder to get the majority of their three, four, five strong candidates than in the old days when there are only really two. But it's also because that system forced a different approach to campaigning, where no longer did candidates have to try to get the whole country, but just a bigger part of the country or bigger parts of the country than the next guy would. The slide on the left you'll see with the two encircled things shows you that the two leading candidates going into 2022 were Sara Duterte and Ferdinand Marcos Jr., none of whom had that magic percentage that you needed to be president, at least 39%. After November, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. achieved a higher percentage than any person had ever achieved in the Fifth Republic up to that point, and we hadn't even gone to the polls yet. It was already in the cards in the survey. So what happened? It's very um, simple, really. Um, it's the culmination of two separate uh, presentations that I won't go into today, but one of them is a 30-year project to accomplish the Marcos restoration, um, which was just the Reader's Digest condensed version of it. The realization, a very basic realization, give up on the generation that kicked you out, convert their children and grandchildren instead. That was their secret. The next is what I was describing at length earlier. The Fifth Republic and the assumptions, the dynamics that had formed it and held it together had to disintegrate. Because only then, with everything up in the air, could you finally get past the old gatekeepers, the old balance of forces, and cobble something together new. So what was that something new? Um, is looking, first of all, at the map. The map on the left with the red and the blue and the yellow shows you the vice presidential race in uh, 2016, yellow for Robredo, red for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. The spoiler for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. was the blue parts in Mindanao that went to Cayetano. If not for that, he probably could have been vice president already as they had hoped and prayed and moved heaven and earth to do. So knowing that, you know that there are two things that get in the way. The first is the center part of our country. And the, th the second part is Mindanao. Look at the map uh, on the right, the green and the pink, and to show you who learned their lesson. Green, of course, is Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Pink is Lenny Robredo. Again, how did this happen? I believe that there is really one architect, and it was one person who had a unique gift. She is old enough to remember the Third Republic and how things were done, young enough to know our present system intimately, not least because she became the second longest serving president in our entire history. And many people still don't realize this about former President Arroyo. Next to President Marcos, she had been the longest in office and was a survivor. It was her and it was she who basically had to sit down her fellow presidential children at the table and say, we either stand together or hang separately. That if you children do not stop your quarreling, we will all go to jail under a reform administration. And it was her and it was she 
who very publicly and very forcefully brought the formerly unachievable. I always tell people, the last time you saw a consolidation of forces on this scale was in 1986 between Cory Aquino and Doy Laurel. But this time in 2022, it was done between North and South, between Old and New, between Marcos and Duterte, who each of them brought to the table what the other one lacked. Marcos had the solid North, but has historical liabilities in Mindanao. Duterte had Mindanao, but couldn't make an inroad in the solid North. The Marcoses have the Romualdeses for Leyte. The Dutertes are ethnic Cebuanos who could bring Cebu to the table. And so you get the whole country, except for Bicol and some of the Ilongo areas, turning green. The, this is math as old as the presidency itself from 1935, where every team was balanced. We had forgotten because starting in 1986 with Marcos Tolentino and Aquino Laurel for the first time in our history, we had all Luzon tandems because the votes were now in Luzon and everyone focused on that for the next 30 years. But someone could simply say, you know, in your daddy's day and my daddy's day, and when your daddy was still alive, it was north and south. And if we do that, we will get a majority for the first time. And that's what happened. So um, that being the case, you found that across all regions, across all classes, across all levels of education and money, there was a majority support for the Marcoses. There was only a couple of pockets that I found very interesting that did not give Marcos a majority. One of them um, shown in this survey, which is Okta and also reflected in Pulse, guess which generation did not give Ferdinand Marcos Jr. a majority? Can any of you guess? What? <laughs> 65 and above. Exactly the generation of Bongbong Marcos. I found this very interesting. Exactly the generation that remembered and lived through martial law. That was the only generation. Guess where he had the highest, as in stratospheric, 77% support? 18 to 25. The ones who are most addicted to their gadgets and to learning and picking things up online. It shows you who did their homework and who were left alone um, in that long 30 year plan because you, nothing they did was going to change anyone's mind anyway. So moving forward then, um, there are some slides here that um, I hope you will get a copy later on because these were revealed in the Pulse um, survey. Um, and this was the last one before uh, the election. So this gives us a snapshot of people's minds as they were about to go and vote. They did not vote necessarily for a Marcos restoration. They did not necessarily vote with actually any past or present regime specifically in mind. They voted for stability and continuity. That much is clear. They voted with their top of mind concern being what would be happening to the country as a result of the pandemic. It was not even, if you look at the next slide, a question of um, the particular characteristics of the candidates. 
you will see if you lined up the different candidates, one is who is considered an achiever, who is considered honest, who is considered smart, all of those things, the changes are very marginal. So no one really stands out. So again, you have to keep going back, and this is what the pollsters would tell you, the fundamental basis for the outcome we have experienced was number one, geography. Nothing more and nothing less. It was ethnic loyalty. The second was, to a certain extent, the popularity of the incumbent president Rodrigo Duterte, that a person, the surveys found, if you happen to like President Duterte, the chances are you will also like Ferdinand Marcos Jr. And of course, you will want to vote for his daughter. Those are the main correlations that can be found. It's less about the far past and more about worrying about the future. So that will be something interesting moving forward, because of course, um, that's not how even the candidates may think of uh, their victories. So I wanted to look at these national concerns, what people uh, decided to vote for. Number one reason, again, just to remind you, which went up by 10 points about during the campaign, which means this was top of mind for the majority of voters, Fighting inflation, not Marcos Sr. or Corey or Pink or anything like that. It's inflation, keeping the government together to do something about it. Even other things that had mattered in previous elections, like honesty and good governance, security, even our territories and our seas went down in importance. It's in many ways a single issue election. And if your concern is inflation, then the message that will resonate with you is babangon tayo muli. So, um, and we're getting near the end. The one takeaway that I believe is overlooked and will be something that matters moving forward is because we are a plebiscitary democracy because the elections are issues in that sense. In our culture, election is absolution. From Emilio Aguinaldo running in 1935 to be able to prove that the country had forgiven him for losing the Filipino-American War, to Jose P. Laurel running in 1949 to prove that he was not a traitor, to Joseph Estrada running again and again to get over the humiliation of Edsa Dos. Election is absolution. The Supreme Court has had to rule that, well, it does not apply to legal cases. But that is just a technicality far removed from our political life. So in one sense, what this election has proved and achieved is an end to the question of 1986. The Marcoses, with certain justification, can say it has been settled conclusively by the verdict of the people. There will always be people who disagree, historians being foremost among them. But in our culture, this will be a powerful statement. The problem is, having settled a question that existed for 30 years, what's left? You are now how going to be judged, not on the past, but what you do in the present and the future. Where the question is, Will you be able to transcend your past in the same manner that you have asked the Filipino people to do it? And that's what we'll be seeing moving forward. Okay, so my last few points before you pass out from... Um, let's be clear that this was an, an, a, one of the most historic elections in our history. This is the third highest percentage any 
winning president has ever achieved in our entire history. There are only two other elections from very long ago that could ever exceed this and beats the last record of uh, before this uh, that stood for over half a century from this Dado Makapagal. At 58.7%, let me repeat, the third highest percentage in Philippine history, which gives you incredible and tremendous political capital moving forward. It also means um, that for the vice president, you would also see that this is the third highest in our history. Uh, I will note here that vice presidents tend to do better than the presidents because the competition usually isn't as fierce. And there's a reason we vote for them separately, which most of us uh, are unaware of. Because in 1935, when we had our first uh, uh, presidential and vice presidential election, there was the question, if a president dies and a vice president takes over, and we have never had them before, why would anyone give them uh, credibility or um, accept them? And therefore, it was believed back then that the vice president should have their own mandate so that if they ever took over, they could claim a mandate of their own and have that legitimacy. We have never revisited the question uh, since. But Sara Duterte is now joining the ranks of Sergio Osmeña, who in 1935 provoked incredible jealousy uh, on the part of my grandfather then, and of every president ever since who has had to look at a percentage of their vice president higher than their own. This is a corrosive comparison that affects the dynamics between presidents and vice presidents. It has then and will continue to do so now. And it also shows that these numbers are approaching percentages we've only really seen in second term elections, um, of which only two uh, were ever successful, but which shows you, again, I think you really need to understand the level of political capital this victory is giving. So um, what about the losers? Um, I count myself in those ranks. Um, here are two maps. The one on the left, oh, go back, please. The one on the left is, yes, the one on the left is uh, provinces. But I think the one on the right uh, is more revealing because it is based on cities and municipalities where each of the, the two main candidates won. It tells you immediately two things. First of all, um, there are pockets of different thinking, even in supposedly solid areas, but they are in places that are urban. Again, bearing that in mind, because I'm going to go back to that word urban uh, later on. You will see the same uh, dynamics in the next couple of maps, which is about the vice presidency. Again, compare the winner takes all system for... Uh, if you're looking at it on provinces, but the more granular look you'll get if you're looking at it in terms of, municip of, of uh, cities and municipalities and the winners. Um, these are three cities. And um, because the, fine, the print is very fine, I wonder how many of you besides Tito Charlie can immediately tell which of these places are being shown. Um, just to help, one on the one on the left most is Quezon City. Uh, the one in the middle, even my, is Pasig. And the one on the right is here in Makati. This is where, uh, looking at the barangay level, where the candidates won. And I'd like to zoom in a little on this because it's going to amplify an important point I'd like to make. If you were to look, for example, at Quezon City, um, 
you wouldn't be perhaps surprised that in New Manila, West Triangle, uh, the UP area, they went pink. And the rest of the city, um, with the most intense green being in the middle where New Era is, and therefore the Iglesia, went green. It also probably wouldn't surprise you if you looked at San Juan, where um, the Savior and Ica area and Addition Hills, so that means Little Baguio and um, you know the, the Green Hills is, is, um, voted overwhelmingly pink. Um, you were talking about percentages in the 60%, 70% range, and the other parts of San Juan uh, voted green. You wouldn't even be surprised if uh, looking at, um, next please, at Mandaluyong, that Wak Wak, Barangay Wak Wak, um, went heavily pink and their other parts didn't. And at the next, um, map, which may be of the most interest to you. Uh, well, this is Pasig. So, uh, Valle Verde, Green Meadows, Capitolio went pink. The rest went green. But the final map here, which we will look at, is um, your home, your home turf, Makati. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. lost in his own neighborhood of Forbes Park. Um, he lost, in fact, in the gated villages. Bel Air, Urdaneta, San Lorenzo, Dasma, Magallanes, Forbes. Um, by, again, overwhelming percentages, 50, 60, 70 percent uh, voting. Now, I'm pointing this out because at first blush, and for many of my partners in, in media, they would say, oh, well, it just shows you the rich voted one way. But these weren't all rich places. There is something more fundamental that unites all these pockets of pink um, that I showed you. And I think it's one that reveals that there are actually two separate nations um, that were on display in this election. Precisely because the divide is so deep that what is it that could bring Forbes voting the same way in the same overwhelming numbers as UP, um, which are filled with people who may not have very much love for each other uh, ideologically or any, any other way. Um, and the reason for this, and I think this is um, the, the closing part of, of our discussion today, is um, an attitude um, or observations that Randy David pointed out back in 2008 and has persisted ever since. He said, only 10% of Filipinos have ever been to a rally, but most of us have taken part in civil disobedience, not paying our taxes, doing something to show our resistance to the law, something where we maybe we won't get caught, but very small percentage of us will actually go out into the streets. Second, as Filipinos, we don't assert our rights by going out with placards. We steal our rights. A very rich term. We steal our rights. We look for ways where we can do what we think should be our right to do. And that the middle class in this country does not believe in elections. It believes in coups and wants and saves itself for that moment when the world will turn upside down and something can be done to radically change things for the better. So if this is the case, um, the dividing line is not money, is not education, is not religion. It's actually your approach to this question. Protest. Are you the type who will go out in the streets or will look for order? Are you the type who will go out and demonstrate your feelings by looking for other like-minded people to wave placards, or will you do it some other way? The other dividing line, I think, beyond this, um, and it is something that you would have seen um, in the past campaign, 
uh, moving forward, because we have to wrap this up, is our approach um, to being Western. That our attitude uh, towards the West actually changes things. And this is something I picked up from an Indian observer. He said, in India today, they have a government that is very Hindu uh, oriented, very aggressively so, so aggressive that they are now despising the founding fathers of their country. They have started wanting to demolish statues of Gandhi. They want to uh, take down any memorialization of Nehru, all the people who had built their country. Why? The founding generations of India and the Philippines were Western educated, Western oriented people who gained respect and the following because they could argue toe to toe with the colonizer. And because of this, for a generation or more, their people rewarded them and supported them, their children and their grandchildren in politics. But that world is gone. Now the West, they don't speak English. They don't look to the West and its books and its theories. They may look to other parts of the East, but no longer the West, with all of the assumptions that everyone in this room still take for granted, whether in education or civic association. All of that has gone away. And so these are the two separate countries we see today. There are still many of us. There is 28% according to the last election. But there is a new Philippines that has been born. And I call it a simple case of SIGA wins. This union of this and this is the victory of the SIGA over the old style of wanting to be prepared, of being able to talk properly, of dressing well, of knowing things. It is now of brazening it out. So much so that here is one uh, closing item that I think is very important because so far we have been talking about presidents and all of that. But let's look at the one election that probably most of us care about the least, which is the party list. But there were two party lists that did the best this time around. Number one, and this is the second time they've not been number one, is the ACT CIS party list, or with its tagline, ang party list ng mga inaapi, supported, of course, by the Tulfos. And the second is the One Rider um, party list, which is basically this retired uh, guy who actually teaches motorcycle riders to finally fight back because every one of you in your cars has seen that the one that the police will pick on all the time are the people on the motorcycles, the people we are all relying on for our deliveries. But no one was taking the cudgels for them until this retired military guy started using his cell phone and broadcasting to everyone. And suddenly they realized the most basic democratic realization of all. We have the power of numbers to even frighten the police. This is the future. This is the new Philippines. This is one that does not know Rizal, that does not read the constitution, that looks for someone who can hit someone else on the head for you. Someone like the president who is about to leave office. Someone very different from the president who is about to take office. And here is my closing part. Um, the deluge. There is going to be a reckoning, uh, but not in the way you think. The fact is that 30 years for any country is a really long time to be stuck in a hamster wheel. And so we are out of that hamster wheel, but we are not sure where we're going to go. Um, we know um, the validity of this statement, that which President Marcos 
wrote in his diary three days after he proclaimed martial law. This is the innermost Marcos. Nothing succeeds like success. In our society in 2022, it's not how you play the game. It's how whether or not you win. Knowing that, what then do you do having won so big as we've seen? Um, here's the problem. Our tomorrow is probably going to be like our yesterdays in that it is now going to be raising the stakes of the kind of leadership we want. We will want to have majority presidents again. We now know what it feels like again. The level of expectation and demand is going to go up. It also means that the old dynamics will come back because you needed North and South. North and South are going to be looking at each other again with suspicion, waiting to see who is going to break the agreement. You have seen it start playing out in the papers. And it also means that because of the particular circumstances that made this coalition possible, we are living in an era of a triple alliance. This is not just North and South. It is not just old and new. It is not just Marcos and Duterte. It is Marcos and Duterte, and the one who holds the balance is Arroyo. And this is something that was shown Again, I'm in media, we're in communications. The medium is the message. That is the picture of the ruling coalition in one picture at the Batasan on the day of the proclamation. There's a reason those are the people who are in the front row. And there's a reason one of them is a former president and the one who brokered the alliance, how this plays out in the next three years, because the first judgment day for the incoming administration will be the midterms in 2018, uh, will be determined as much by whether uh, former President Arroyo believes that the one she was chaperoning to this ceremony, the new vice president, is getting her due according to their deal. Remember, Item one in the agreement has already been voided. And that is that it was Mrs. Arroyo who was supposed to become Speaker of the House. That's already been fallen by the wayside. And so my closing picture is one um, that I think says it all. It is old and new, and the more things change, the more they remain the same. This is a picture no one would have dreamed ever seeing, but it is the new reality. It is uh, the dynamics uh, moving forward. And it is one that is going to play out, not just in personalities, but think of it, not just of the pictures of the people in this picture, but the previous picture. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. ran as the candidate of the Federalist Party, a party no one ever heard of before, but it is, I promise, and shows you a direction. Mrs. Arroyo is the head of a party and a movement and a group that believes and wants a shift away from the presidential system to the parliamentary system. These are not necessarily two points of view that can meet in the middle, particularly when it requires two people to abandon what they have sought, which is power. It means Marcos's thinking of a future where they will have less power because the presidency might have less power. And it is one where a Duterte may think, I may never become president, or I might become only a ceremonial president. And was this all that that was about?
that is actually where the argument is going to be joined in the next three or six years. So I wanted to thank you for um, staying with me through this long um, exposition, but I felt it was important. Please uh, get in touch with me if you have any more questions. And uh, we do have a civics program called Proyecto Filipino that you can watch on YouTube or TV, because I really believe um, it's not history that has let us down. It's that we no longer have a sense of civics. And it's that civic education that is the missing link in our country and which we have to make our joint effort moving forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Manolo, for that <coughs> thorough and very insightful uh, presentation. Um, we have just a little bit time for, for two questions. Uh, yes, uh, PP Cesar Campos. Uh, there's a microphone there at the back, if you if you if you could please, um, so you could be properly heard. There is one explanation that has been going on that uh, Marcos won because two of these section that you were explaining were beneficiary of the, the president. There were a lot of things that were given to the North and also in the South. That's the explanation that it was the generation that they received the beneficiary. What do you feel about that? Um, that's, that's just good old standard <laughs> political math. But I think what was important was we have to realize that it was not, um, it was not inevitable. That really the, the, the dynamics are so strong to everyone just beat, go to the beat of their own drum that it really took almost a superhuman effort to try to get people to sit down. And I really think it, uh, now, um, so there, there are actually three components here. If the president under the present administration did his job, which all presidents are supposed to do and reward all their allies, then actually he, um, he ran a better administration than his critics um, are conceding. But beyond that, even he himself, we forgot, he had his own candidate, but all his popularity could not make his own candidate take off. Um, in fact, what I found very interesting was the public decided on Indaisara regardless of what the president wanted. Um, because they had their own, their own thought, and I found that very, very unusual. Um, but again, nothing was certain. Um, any one of them, Bongbong, Sara, or Lenny in a three-way race could have had a chance. No one could have been certain. But by uniting two, it made it certain. And that was um, something we haven't seen in a generation. Okay. One more question, uh, Past President Rui Moreno, please. Uh, the microphone, please, at the back. Thank you. That's the last question. Uh, by the way, before you ask your question, before, when, uh, when the presidents have done their acknowledgments of the, for the guest speaker, there will be a photo op right in front here. So please, if rather than rush out, if you could just spend one time to so that we can memorialize this uh, last joint meeting for the Rotary. P.P. Uh, Roy. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Quezon. Very interesting um, presentation. My question is, you have emphasized the point that now we have the SIGA mentality that's going on. But this SIGA mentality is not only here with us. It seems to be global in nature, whether it's in Europe or... And, and maybe the SIGA mentality in some ways 
is also what is is also the style in ASEAN, except that we see it seems to be milder. Look at Singapore, look at Malaysia, the way they've been, you know, in other words, it is a strong uh, government. Uh, would you, I, what is your comment on that? In fact, there is something very interesting. I was reading a, a report by a Singaporean think tank and in fact, their perspective is very interesting. They're saying that uh, the victory of, of Mr. Marcos is the opening salvo in a different kind of wave because they say it's accompanied by two other things happening at the same time. In Malaysia, former Prime Minister Najib, who you remember was removed from power under... Um, the biggest um, uh, financial scandal in their country's history is making a comeback. Number one. Number two, in Indonesia, there is now a palpable sense of Suharto nostalgia. So in that sense, um, what we don't know is, is, it, may, is, it, is this happening? Is Prime Minister Najib using the same communications uh, strategies and technologies that let's say the Marcoses have proven so good at? Or is there something else happening there? Is it simply that everyone else is just so incompetent? Uh, and what explains it in um, Indonesia where are they also um, are, are, are the Suhartos? Because before Tommy Suharto could never get elected, but have they figured something out? Are they learning from, from the Marcoses? So what is it? I think it's that thing I mentioned at the very beginning of Randy David. He's stating that there is such a thing as a crisis of modernity, that when globalization, pandemics, and everything shatters your certainties. We want to retreat to what was familiar, to what we remember. And that is what, remember, make America great again. It's an appeal to, to when, you know, everyone felt safe and number one. President Franco, uh, would you like to uh, do a response or uh, would you like President, okay, good. Magjak employ muna kayo, ba? Pwede rin sa amin yun. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, are you guys uh, game for another 50 minutes? <laughs> All right. Um, Manolo, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. And um, I just have a couple of comments. Um, I, I didn't conduct a scientific poll, um, but um, like the last six months uh, leading up to the election, every janitor, security guard, baggage attendant I would speak to, in other words, blue collar workers, street workers, gardeners, I would ask them, who are you gonna vote for? And then when they say Marcos, they say, and I say, why? He hasn't paid his taxes in years, but that's not important to them. So uh, I, I, what I get from them is that um, Filipinos like the underdog. And then two is what, you know, as evidenced by um, the party list who won the most vote, uh, they love the inaapi. So they say, kawawa naman si Bongbong inaapi. Sinas- kung ano-ano mga sinasabi to call him. And then secondly, um, of course, uh, you're a historian, but this issue is not as important as controlling inflation. So um, I just hope that um, uh, I don't know what you are planning to do uh, about um, there's rumors that um, there's a move to blot out certain parts, portions of our Philippine history. Um, so um, and with the. Um, Ed, education secretary nominee uh, Sarah Duterte in place, uh, that might not be difficult to do. So uh, I hope uh, you as a historian uh, preserve our history. And uh, do I give my token now or later? Yes, uh, and Manolo, um, for gracing our, our both clubs 
with your presence as our guest speaker, we are pleased to present to you this certificate as a loving donor in the PDA device closure procedure. That's a heart procedure. Perform on beneficiary Nova Alfonso, a one-year-old from Unevo Ecija. Thank you so much. Um, and um, Manolo, another one is, uh, I know you're a um, high-tech person. So again, for gracing our club with your presence as guest speaker, we are pleased to include you as a recipient of the prestigious limited edition, edition non-fungible token with only 300 in circulation that exists in the Ethereum blockchain web network of the Rotary Club of Makati West, 52nd year commemorable collect. This is legit, okay? And we're gonna send you how to download your NFT. And this could be valued uh, millions of dollars about 40 years from now if, we, if the planet still exists by that time. Because of climate change, they say it may not be livable. So thank you so much, um, Manolo. Right. Wow. Wow, Manolo, you kept us enthralled again as usual with your with your talk. I actually took a second look at the at your topic and uh, it struck me because you put a question mark at the main heading of your title from the fifth to the sixth republic and with it the insinuation that uh, the overwhelming electoral victory, uh, the largest in recent history but the third largest in, at the aggregate spells the onset of a new republic under the Marcos restoration. Our speaker has shown in uh, one of the latter slides one important data point, and this was also indicated in the pre-election surveys, that majority of Marcos' supporters are those under 30, and these are voters who were not born yet when martial law was imposed. As one sociologist aptly described it, the recent election has been nothing less than a battle for the nation's narrative, and it appears that the Marcos narrative prevails. As Manola said, give up on the elders, concentrate on the young. In his previous talk before the Rotary Club of Makati, I distinctly recall you, Manolo, saying that while Duterte's victory over the Liberal Party's bet then, Mar Rojas in 2016, may have signaled the death of the Liberal Party, the wipeout of the opposition coalition or the Ocho Derecho senatorial slate in the midterm election in 2019, buried the opposition further six feet underground. That was your term, buried six feet underground. With the results of the recent elections, I really don't know what still votes for the opposition, which ran a consolidated campaign against Duterte and Marcos, but towards the end of the campaign, they were less strident in their attacks of Duterte because Duterte was still uh, figuring high in acceptance. But maintain the consistent uh, ardent attack against Marcos. Still, the outcome was so disappointing for the opposition, which seemed not to be able to shake off the pejorative yellow tag, which their detractors have successfully embossed upon them like a scarlet letter, that one cannot help but think that a new order, a new republic, one that is completely divorced from the Fifth Republic ushered in by the Cory administration may have already taken hold. That was the progeny of the great divorce which you have mentioned a while back. This reminded me of a quote that was attributed to John Adams in 1814 and he says, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. Maybe the younger Mar Marcos offered a refreshing perspective or a choice after the presidents before him were perceived rightly or wrongly to have failed to solve or address the problems of grinding poverty and corruption, which continue to dominate the daily lives of the Filipino people. That is why of late you hear president-elect Bongbong Marcos talk about quote unquote aspirations of the many Filipinos, riding on the disappointment by most of the electorate to what political analyst Richard Haydarian said was a succession of administrations which came short 
of fulfilling, of, of fulfilling the fundamental ideals and aspirations of the Filipino people, which was expressed in the 1986 revolution. We will see, Mr. Kesson here said that even if Mr. Marcos Jr. had achieved electoral success, he would be confronted with what was par for the course for the previous regimes, the experience of having been brought to power by raising expectations. Mr. Marcos would have to meet such expectations and cobble or maintain that political coalition with the families uh, that matter, or if not, project the perception of meeting and not failing those expectations. But this is our country, and we can only hope that our new leaders will indeed keep the pledges they have made during the election and remain bound by the social contract, which was renewed when the citizens voted them into power. So thank you, Manolo, again for gracing our session, our meeting for today. Um, we are giving you, yes, we turned 55 already, so we're giving you the 55th edition of our coffee table book entitled A Resolute Spirit of Service. And you can go through the pages of the coffee table book while sipping this fine bottle of wine, a cab. And with it, and with it, a replica of a steel, bud, a steel plate that will be put in the rift bud in the Sea of Narvacan, uh, pursue one to Rotary's seventh area of focus, which is protecting the environment. To uh, my classmate Franco and R.C. Makati West, third time's a charm, and it was really a pleasure having this joint meeting with you. So can you, can you adjourn the meeting in behalf of, Rosa, of R.C. Makati West? I paid those guys, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you, you get a complimentary ticket to the concert. <laughs> so uh, before I adjourn, I'm inviting everyone, particularly you, Rotary Club Makat Makati Rotarians, um, to a what we call all cluster meeting. This, we have gr divided our club into eight home clusters. So uh, this will be on 5.30 on thir thir Tuesday, June 14th. And our featured speaker is Jimmy Flor Cruz. He has uh, written a book which will be available in most bookstores in July. And if you can't wait till July, you can order it now in Amazon called Class of 77. So I will forward that uh, poster to uh, President Louis. And I now call this 2,352nd meeting of the Rotary Club of Makati West adjourned. And let us give support to our daughter club by purchasing tickets to the Martin Nivero concert. Huh? So in behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, this meeting is adjourned. Please come forward.